what is your experience and understanding of communion? Growing up in the church, for me, it was just a ritual that we did on a Sunday, usually once a month during service. Uh, the elders would wear white gloves and pass around these golden plates or bowls filled with broken up little crackers. And they'd also pass around little tiny uh, plastic cups of grape juice. Then you'd have to wait as uh, you hold these things as the pastor usually retold the story of the Last Supper they found in all four Gospels, where on the night that he was betrayed, Jesus, sitting with his disciples, took some bread and broke it and says, this is my body broken for you. And then he poured some wine into a cup and gave thanks. And he says, this is my blood shed for you. This is the cup of the new covenant. And he said, every time you you take this cup, you receive this, you do this in remembrance of me. And so that's my that was my understanding and experience. And it was very tiny, uh, little little shot glass, not even full of a, sh a shot glass full of juice. It was even smaller than that, and a uh, little little nibble of cracker. And that was somehow supposed to represent this ritual that we were meant to remember. Uh, what Jesus did for us, that he paid the ultimate price, he suffered and sacrificed himself to die on the cross for our sin, and that we would now participate with him in this fellowship, in this communion, that we are now family, and we have entered into this new covenant where we're no longer under the law, but under grace. So that, that was my general idea. But in this new season, God has been teaching such a deeper and greater revelation of what communion is. In fact, the Catholic Church, who has <clears throat> actually, in one sense, compared to many of the mainline or Protestant denominations, has a very radical view of communion, even though that was the the predominant view in most of church history for the first 1500 years. And that was the idea that the elements actually were the body and blood of Jesus and something that's called transubstantiation, that you could just take normal bread and normal wine. But as soon as the priest or the father blesses it, it somehow metamorphosizes, trans. Uh, mutates into the physical body, flesh, and blood of Jesus. And so they took this so seriously that they wouldn't allow, they had to be very careful not to allow anything to fall, no, no crumbs, no spillage of the wine, because that was the literal body and blood of Jesus. And so uh, I was learning that people would drink from the same cup, uh, which is still done even today in some places, even after covid uh, or the the priest himself would stick the, the 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 wafer the host into the person's mouth so that nothing falls on the ground nothing is wasted and the reason why it's called a host uh, in Latin it host means sacrifice or victim so he was Jesus is the Lamb of God who gave himself who was slain for the sin of the world so that's where we get that term uh, and so. Uh, there's so much to learn, and uh, in one sense, it's not new revelation, but the, the Lord is restoring it to the body of Christ today, the importance of communion. And there is, in one sense, going a, a communion revival going on. Even within the Catholic Church, uh, their <clears throat> high-level leaders are talking about this Eucharistic revival. And it's a three-year plan, three to four-year plan, where they're going to bring back to the forefront this idea of the body and blood present in communion, and for people to gather around this and experience this true divine fellowship with the Lord and with one another. And uh, the idea of Eucharist, it's interesting, communion, there's no specific word for this ritual in the Bible. Communion in the Greek is more uh, koinonia, fellowship, uh, but uh, there's no specific term for this ritual act or this meal. That's why it's called the Last Supper. Uh, it's more of a, a term that was added on later. 
but the term Eucharist uh, just comes from the Greek U-E-U -E is good and charis means grace. And so that word is found in the Last Supper story when Jesus took the cup and gave thanks, gave good grace, said the good grace. And so was Eucharistio or Eucharisto, something like that. And don't quote me on the Greek, but the idea being that he gave thanks and uh, <clears throat> passed around the cup for everyone to share. And so that's where we get the term for this uh, ritual of communion, Eucharist. Uh, but it, and another term that's used during that story is eulogeo, which is where we get the term eulogy, uh, like a good word. It literally means good word, eu, you, and logos. So I think that's a more accurate term for what's going on because what communion is, is the good word broken, the body of Christ, the word of God made flesh, broken for us to participate. So I'm not petitioning for us to change the name or anything like that, but it really is helpful to understand uh, where these terms come from and the traditions and the history and what the Lord really wants us to know about this special meal. And it's more than just a ritual. It's more than just a sign or a symbol. There is a spiritual fellowship that actually takes place within this communion. And uh, he's releasing, again, I'm saying this, releasing this revelation all over the world today here in America in the Catholic Church. They're talking about a national Eucharistic revival. Uh, Lou Engel, which many people know, a prophet based out in Colorado, he is organizing something called the Great Communion Revival, where he has had dreams and words of the Lord about people gathering around communion again. And so actually... Uh, convening conferences, gatherings where people focus on the bread and the wine, the body and the blood of Jesus, which is pretty amazing to think that uh, we would just gather around this concept of communion. And Francis Chan, an amazing uh, leader in the body of Christ, he even said recently that he believes the Lord's Supper should be at the center of worship. And he remarked that the shift from emphasizing the sermon as the central aspect of a service has really harmed Christian unity, that we should go back to what it was originally, that we gather around communion. And Jesus says, whenever you do this, you do this in remembrance of me. And the early church knew this, they understood this, and they practiced this. Acts 2, in Acts 2 of the early church on the day of Pentecost, it says they <clears throat> They met together in the temple courts, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the breaking of bread and fellowship and to prayer. And so they made this part of their daily uh, habit, their ritual, where they would break bread together uh, in remembrance of God, as well as understanding that there's deep, significant impact for participating in this meal. Uh, <clears throat> it's interesting to think uh, during this COVID lockdown, some churches got created because many churches were shut down. And so uh, priests and other pastors, they thought, oh, we'll do drive-through communion where you don't have to actually come in, get out of your car or come into a building. Just drive through and we'll just hand you communion, serve you communion in your car. Or they would even mail, they would bless the elements and then mail it to people so that they could receive it themselves. And then oh, they'd obviously have virtual communion where they would do it online and encourage people to receive it. But uh, different denominations have different beliefs regarding this because some people say you can only receive elements that have been blessed by the priest or the bishop or the pastor. Uh, that the, the lay person is not even able to handle the elements. That's, again, why some denominations, the, the congregation member isn't allowed to touch the communion. They're just allowed to receive it from the priest directly. And even in some congregations, uh, the, the lay people don't even get to drink the wine or the juice. The priest just does that from the chalice, and <clears throat> that's he represents, he symbolizes receiving it on behalf of the body. And so everyone varies uh, depending on which tradition. 
Uh, but it's important for us to, to be taught by the Lord on this. Remember the grace of the new covenant in Jeremiah 31, which as we do communion, we enter into this new covenant. And one of the aspects of that new covenant is that uh, we won't need anyone, we won't need to teach our brother or tell our neighbor, know the Lord, for they will all know the Lord from the least to the greatest. And this is Isaiah 54, 13, that the Lord himself will teach us and great will be our peace, which Jesus actually quotes that Isaiah passage in John 6, 45. And John 6, 45, this is after the feeding of the 5,000, where he has the crowd sit down in green grass and uh, he takes the fish and the loaves and he blesses it as well. And uh, it multiplies and he's able to feed the multitudes and they actually have leftover. And after that story, uh, <clears throat> he commands his disciples to go across in a boat. And remember, they're struggling across the, the, the lake and he winds up walking across. And uh, that's the story where Peter walks on water and when, he, when they finally get over to the other side, the crowd is there waiting for him because they had realized that Jesus had left and they were looking for him. And when Jesus sees the crowds, he says something very interesting. He said, you didn't come. You're not here because you saw the miracles. He goes, you're here because you, you ate the bread and the fish and you had your fill. And basically what he was trying to say is that uh, you enjoyed the meal that I gave you and now you want more fish sandwiches. And so he responds to them. He says, don't work for food that spoils, but work for food that remains to everlasting life. And, uh, <clears throat> and so this leads into this whole discussion about being the bread of life, that he is actually the manna that comes down from heaven. And the Jews are very confused because they say, are you greater than our forefather Moses, who gave uh, them the manna in the desert? And Jesus corrects them and says, it wasn't Moses who gave them the manna. It was my father, it was God who actually gave them, which is true, if you remember that story in Exodus. And uh, 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 Jesus begins to teach them that, I am the bread that comes down from heaven, and whoever eats of me will never hunger again, and whoever drinks will never thirst again. And so this is a very confusing message, it's perhaps the most offensive, one of the most offensive sermons that he ever gives. And the reason for this is because at the end of this message, so many of his disciples leave, not just some of the crowd, but a lot of his disciples, people that have committed to follow him, wind up leaving him. They said, this is this message is too difficult. How can we continue to follow this person? Why? Because he was saying, my, my flesh is the bread, and you have to eat my flesh. He says, my flesh is real food. And not only that, my blood is the, the wine, the drink. My blood is real drink. And so you have to eat my flesh and drink my blood. Two things that were actually forbidden by the law in the Old Testament. This idea of cannibalism uh, was outlawed by the Lord himself. And yet Jesus here as the, the manifest son of God is saying, oh, you have to you have to eat my flesh and drink my blood. And you can understand why the people were getting so confused and offended and rather than try and explain, he allows all these people to leave, and Jesus turns his back to them, and he addresses his 12, the apostles, and he says, you're not going to leave too, are you? <laughs> I don't think Jesus would be invited to too many evangelistic conferences as a, as a guest speaker, <laughs> because he you would think that, oh, look at what's happening. The disciples are, are, are probably wondering, hey, we have left everything to follow you, and you're you're really offending them through this message. Shouldn't you just make sure that they understand what you're trying to say and keep them as part of our group? But you're just letting them walk away. And, and instead, Jesus is challenging them and says, you're not going to leave too, are you? And uh, they, they respond by saying, Lord, uh, you have the words of life. To who else can we go? And uh, one translation, modern translation of that is probably... We have no idea what the heck you're talking about, eating your flesh and drinking your blood, but we cannot but help experience fire and passion whenever you speak. And even though you're offending our mind, our heart is burning, and we're going to continue to follow you until we understand 
what uh, you are actually talking about. And Jesus likes to do this. He likes to test our heart. He likes to offend our minds in order to test our heart. And that happens throughout history. That happens throughout the Bible where he'll test people. God tested Abram by calling him to sacrifice his, his son, Isaac. And can you imagine how offensive that must be in his mind? How could a loving father ask uh, to do this, even though God was the one that promised Abraham this miracle son. And here again, Jesus is testing them. Even in the feeding of the 5,000, he tested them. He said, you give them something to eat. And he, through the disciples, experienced this great miracle of the multiplication of food. And so here they are again, and Jesus is purposely offending their mind in order to reveal what's in their heart. And the disciples, in this sense, passed the test because they they didn't grasp what he, what he was saying mentally, but they still continue to pursue with their heart. And this is one way that we can love God with all of our heart. And uh, because there are so many things about the kingdom that are, in what, from a carnal mind, difficult to understand. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 2 that <clears throat> the the foolishness of God is greater than the wisdom of this world, and that you cannot understand the spiritual without the spirit. So these things are foolishness to those who are perishing, and we need the Holy Spirit in order to grasp some of these concepts. Even the Jewish leader Nicodemus in John 3, when he comes to Jesus, and Jesus is talking about being born again, born from above, born of water and spirit, and uh, Nicodemus has no idea what he's talking about. He's thinking just in natural terms. Can a man enter his mother's womb and be born again? What are you talking about? And Jesus is like, well, I'm talking to you about these things and you don't understand. How can you understand if I talk about spiritual heavenly things? And so uh, we need the Spirit of God to be able to understand this revelation and what the Spirit is saying. Remember, Jesus would always say in the, through the churches of Revelation, to him who has ears, let him he hear. And so what the Spirit is saying. So may we hear what the Spirit is saying. Remember, Jesus has said in, in John 10, he's the good shepherd and my sheep know my voice. And so we have the ability to hear. He even said, blessed are your ears for they hear, for your eyes and for they see. Blessed are your eyes, for they see. And so uh, we have to just believe that he's given us the ability, the capability to hear his voice, to discern what he's saying, so that we can understand these truths. And one of the reasons why he spoke in parables is because they would be ever hearing, the people would be ever hearing, but not uh, listening. They wouldn't be understanding, they, because their hearts were hard and they were stubborn. And so it requires humility and this uh, grace to partner with the Holy Spirit to understand what God is trying to teach. Remember, Jesus promised the gift of the Holy Spirit, and one of the main uh, responsibilities of the Holy Spirit is to guide us into all truth. He's the greatest teacher in the universe, and this is the grace of the new covenant. We don't need anyone to teach us. Why? Because the Holy Spirit now becomes our primary teacher. Obviously, he raises up teachers, prophets, evangelists, pastors, apostles, and, and they're there to teach and equip as well, but they have to have their proper place in our lives as supplemental sources of learning to the primary source of the Lord himself, Isaiah 54, 13, and John 6, 45. So uh, going back to communion, uh, John 6 is perhaps the most significant passage on this uh, subject. Even though uh, communion wasn't necessarily introduced until later on in the Gospels at the end, uh, during the Last Supper, again, which was a Passover meal, uh, Jesus speaks very plainly about this in John 6, that my flesh is real food and my blood is real drink, and whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood will abide in me, and I will abide in them. And so this is this communion with union, this unity of God and man together through communion. And it's a mystery. And the holy it's only the, the Spirit that enables us to understand this mystery and to realize that there is such power and grace in participating in this 
uh, meal, this fellowship, and not to get bogged down by the specifics and the details about, oh, should we use wine or juice or bread or gluten-free crackers or who can uh, hold the elements and who cannot? How often should we do it? Those are all things that man decides uh, and, and carries on through tradition, but God wants us to learn directly from him. And <clears throat> in one sense, he wants us to have this communion, this fellowship, this Eucharist, this eulogia, this good word every single day. Why? Because we don't live by bread alone, Jesus said, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. He, Jesus says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. Whoever opens the door, Revelation 3, I will come in and dine with him and he with me. So uh, think about this, this fellowship as a family, as a father, or as a husband and wife, that they they commune together every day, sharing meals together. And that's what brings this intimacy, this union together. Uh, and so God wants us to do this every single day, even if it's uh, <clears throat> just with him and the Lord. It doesn't necessarily always have to be in, in a, a group setting. It's great to do it in groups. Uh, and I encourage everyone, whenever it's possible, it, it doesn't have to be a service. Even if you're just gathering with other believers, just get in the habit of, hey, let's. would you be interested in doing communion together and just meditating and, and connecting to that union with the Lord and with one another? Why? Because we also are the body of Christ. So somehow, supernaturally, for those who are in Christ, he has made us to become part of him. And God told me this one time as I was doing communion, he goes, you know, you are what you eat. And I thought about that for a moment. He goes, what are you eating? I said, well, the bread. He goes, what is that? He goes, well, that's your, your body. I go, that's my body. And so you're eating my body. You become what you eat. So you become the body of Christ. Again, this is a great mystery. And, uh, um, <clears throat> and so all of these things, uh, regardless of what type of elements we use. In fact, you know, I'm not a big fan of the current way that a lot of churches do communion because uh, from a, a human standpoint, it's not very enjoyable having this stale little cracker or this, you know, kind of old juice that's been in this plastic container and uh, it's, you know, it's separated into different sediments and, and things like that. It, it It's not very enjoyable from... Uh, a taste perspective, uh, but in the in the early church, they would gather around a meal. It was, you know, a love feast, that type of thing. But because of practicality issues of time and cost and and all these things, and because many people uh, in their faith communities are bound within the time constraints of a service. They, they have manufactured for mass production these little communion cups that with uh, little wafers on top. And, and, and so I like places where they actually give like fresh bread and a choice of wine or if you want juice or whatever. But, uh, you know, in the communities that I've been part of that do the wine, a lot of people enjoy the wine, and which again, <clears throat> challenges a lot of people's religious spirits because there are many churches that don't believe that we should drink alcohol, even though Jesus did, and he commanded his disciples to drink the, the, the wine. Anyway, uh, uh, but I want to encourage you to go deeper with the Lord. Ask him about what, what the significance of communion is. And uh, in terms of handling the elements, it's the priest who is able to handle the elements. And so you have to believe that Everyone in Christ is a priest. First Peter 2, you are a royal priesthood, a holy nation. And so you have been commissioned by the Father to be a priest in the order of Melchizedek forever, just like his son Jesus. And so we have been sanctified to uh, handle the elements. And we can serve others communion, uh, and we can also serve ourselves communion. And uh, I want to submit to you that we can even allow Jesus himself to serve as communion in the spirit realm, to have encounters. Why? This is what he told me one time. He says, what is the, the bread? 
And, and when you look at John 6, uh, we're meant to take communion. And <clears throat> he says, this is, this is the bread at the Last Supper. But John 6, Jesus ex uh, explains that the bread is his flesh. Okay, so the bread that we receive in communion is his flesh. Remember John 6, my flesh is real food. Okay, I am the bread, the manna that comes down from heaven. So he's uh, specifically identifying what this bread is. This is my body broken for you. Okay, so the bread not just represents his body, it is his body, okay? So the Catholic Church was right about this, this transubstantiation or whatever it is, it, it, it is the body of Christ. It's not just flour and water and, and yeast, it, it, is, it is the body of Christ. And he goes, what is, what is the body? And this goes back to John 1. And his flesh, the body, the flesh is the word. Remember, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And so the bread is the flesh. The flesh is the word. So he is the logos. That's why I think communion should be eulogio rather than Eucharist, because logos is the word. Jesus is the logos. And so um, he is the good word that we are partaking in. And so the bread is his flesh, the flesh is the word, and Jesus asked, what is the word? And Jesus said, my word is spirit and life. That's what he said, my words to you are spirit and life. So uh, God is spirit, First John, uh, John 4. And so um, Jesus, in his original state, was spirit, and that spirit uh, had a sound, a vibration. It wasn't a word. Remember, out of the mouth of God, uh, God spoke, let there be light. And who is the light of the world? Jesus. And so Jesus is this word that uh, came into the world and the darkness could not overcome it, John 1. And so he is a spirit being. And he is the word, living word. And that word became flesh at a specific time, uh, through Mary, this Holy Spirit uh, overshadowed Mary, and she conceived and gave birth where the Word of God took on physical form, human form, a flesh. But if you could see in the spirit realm, that flesh was actually a Word, a living Word. Uh, the Word of God is living and active, Hebrews 4, and sharper than any double-edged sword, able to divide between soul and spirit and all these things. And so, uh, but then that word is spirit. So it is spirit. If you could see the words of Jesus, the words of God coming out of his mouth in the spirit realm, you would see that it comes out as spirit. And on that spirit or within that spirit is life, is zoe, it's lahayim. And so Jesus is spirit. He is the word who was made flesh, and his flesh is the bread that we receive. And so when we take communion, we're actually taking the body, the flesh of Jesus, which, which is the word of God, which is the spirit of God. So in essence, we are actually participating. We are communing. We are receiving the very spirit of of God. This is why we can actually do spiritual communion, where we don't actually need the physical elements. Why? Because, again, we don't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Jesus can actually serve us communion in the Spirit as our great high priest. And so I want to encourage you just to ask him about this. And if you need uh, bread and and wine or crackers and juice or whatever it is, that's totally fine. You can still do that. But uh, there are some people who are sick and can't have those things or they don't have access to those things. So are they limited? Are they restricted from taking communion? No. Why? Because we are spirit beings. We live according to the spirit. And he wants us to realize that these things that we hold on to are actually... Uh, <clears throat> They are particle form of a greater spiritual reality. They're shadows of a kingdom truth. And that kingdom truth is that this, this bread is actually spirit. And he wants us, 
and when you think about when you receive spirit, what happens, that spirit now becomes part of you. So just as we receive food and that food breaks down and we convert it to energy and it becomes part of our cellular structure, our being, uh, in the same way, that spirit that we partake now becomes part of us. And we are first, uh, <clears throat> 1 Corinthians 6, 17 says, those who are united with Christ are one spirit together. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is living inside of us. And so uh, come to God. And you can go to the tabernacle, go to the table of showbread, and ask the high priest, Jesus, to uh, serve you communion or teach you about communion. And let this become a daily ritual for you, something that you yearn and long for and enjoy. Because why? It's fellowship. So that we don't have to wait uh, once a month or every week, once on a Sunday within our uh, uh, community of faith to, to do this. But we can do this every single day with the Lord. You can even do it multiple times a day. And uh, you could do it with with physical food, or you could ask the Lord for spiritual food. How, however it is, it's let the Lord teach you and grow your communion experience and understanding because there is so much power in this. Remember, Paul even says in 1 Corinthians 11 that some people have gotten sick and have actually fallen asleep or died because they were improperly taking communion. They weren't discerning the body and the blood of Jesus in communion. And so there's so much power in this. Uh, and it's not to say that that someone who takes it poorly is, is necessarily cursed, but remember, by his stripes, we have been healed. By the wounds on his body. And so we are healed. So think about if we're actually receiving the body, we can even receive healing. That's why he says, whoever comes to me, whoever believes in me, uh, we'll never hunger or thirst again because there's something that happens when we tap into this this power of spiritual communion that it actually releases life, it releases blessing, it releases healing and wholeness, and to the point where Moses experienced this on the mountain where he didn't eat or drink for forty days. Jesus in the desert, he didn't eat or drink for forty days, and so. Uh, you know, in heaven, there is eating and drinking, but you don't need it in order to survive. It's just for enjoyment. It's just for celebration. It's just for fun. It's not for nutrition. It's not for growth or energy. Why? Because in him, we live and move and have our being. He is the source of all things. And so uh, I believe that the Lord is going to release a great revelation. And I'm thankful that the body of Christ is catching on to this because uh, we're seeing so many more uh, movements towards communion coming back to the forefront of the Christian faith and the Christian practice. And this is what it means to be a believer, is to learn how to commune with the Word of God, the living and active Word of God, to be one with that, and then to be ministers of communion, of that Word to other people as priests and kings, that we can now offer his body and his blood to other people and invite them into fellowship. Remember 2 Corinthians, we are ambassadors of reconciliation, not counting people's sin against them, but making an appeal to be reconciled to God and to receive the good grace, uh, the good word of his body and, and his blood broken for him, for them, and his blood shed for them, that they can now come into this union, this fellowship as well, where all their sin is forgiven, where they're given a new nature, their sinful nature is crucified with Christ, they're given a new holy nature, a very, the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead now begins to dwell in them, and that even Christ himself begins to dwell in their hearts by faith. And so, and I can go on for hours about this, but uh, just end this here. Uh, this really is just an invitation for you uh, to begin pursuing the Lord in communion. 
And I want to encourage you, just one practical way to do that is schedule a time to do communion every single day with the Lord. You can invite other people, family and friends to do it with you and just together uh, talk about what the Lord's teaching you and how he's guiding you, uh, because this is the key for accessing our unity with the Lord, our union with him, for manifesting as sons of God. Uh, this is what we've been created for. We've been predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. And we cannot rely on earthly things, human ritual, uh, doctrines of men anymore. And they're not they're not good enough because they haven't transformed the world. It's only through this revelation that Jesus gives through the Holy Spirit that is going to bring about this transformation. In fact, we are meant to be uh, transformed, transfigured just like Jesus was transfigured. Uh, and Paul says this in Romans 12, do not be conformed any longer to the patterns of this world, but be metamorphosized, be transfigured by the renewing of your mind. And uh, you are what you eat. May we participate and commune with the Lord uh, in this holy communion, in this meal, and be transformed. That will actually even benefit our physical body as well, as well as our mind, uh, and obviously our spiritual health, but all three of these things coming together so that we manifest the nature of Christ in him, First John 4, so that as he is, so are we in this world. So bless you uh, to do communion, uh, to learn about communion, to share communion with other, other people. Uh, one of the great things about uh, the lockdown, and trying to be positive about it, was that so many people began making bread. <laughs> and uh, that happened to us. Uh, someone even bought us, a, a, gave us a, a bread maker. And we bought these 50 pound bags of bread flour. And we just started making bread and giving them out and encouraging people to do communion. May you do that uh, wherever you are and actually move forward this movement of bringing people to the Lord's table to commune with him and with one another in love and peace, and joy in healing and wholeness and in unity. So bless you. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance to you and give you shalom.